Hey, Adam Richardson here, pastor at Sandhurst. Thank you for joining us for this stream on your device. And we have prayed it would be an encouragement and a blessing to you on your journey. If you're outside the Sandhurst family, we hope that it will only supplement and not replace the teaching that you receive from your leaders and the care you receive in the church where you are plugged in. If you have any questions about renewing or starting a relationship with God through Christ, please contact us through the email or the phone below and we'll be in touch. A few tech suggestions for the best online experience. First of all, the bigger the device, the better. So ideally, you could plug your phone into your television. If you're having any tech trouble, you can reach out to Reeves Cannon at this number below. So we'd love for you also to repost and share this link so others can enjoy it as well. So we have prayed that this will be a blessing and encouragement to you. Enjoy. What do you guys see? What are your first impressions of this blob of color? What? Okay, dragon, nice. Seraphim, wow, you guys are really spiritual. This is awesome. <laughs> good. Okay. This is a good example of what modern art looks like. This is modern art. And if any of you guys landed with, this is the feeling I have between my best friend and I, then you aligned with the artist who called this best friends. And maybe like, if you're like me, you're like, okay, I don't see it. But maybe you're one of those few people, maybe you're like a Brooks Watford or Jamie walking, watching from Costa Rica, like, yeah, that's what I first thought too. It's good. But probably not. Uh, but the reason I bring up this random piece of art is to remind us as we continue in the middle of Revelation that the book of Revelation uh, is a little bit like different kinds of art. Uh, we get our come back to that. We get the beginning of the end, Christ's love for the church, and it really seems like realism, right? Like we can see one for one, churches, problems, solutions, commands. And then we see things like the throne room where it kind of looks like Van Gogh's Starry Night, right? It's impressionistic to where we can get an idea of what's going on just by looking at it. And you get to the middle and things get weird. Again, where we're at, the book of Revelation feels weird. And coming back, what does matter about modern art, though, which is what we're at now, is it's real, it's meaningful, and it requires an explanation from the artist. So as we look at all of these symbols, as we look at beasts and the whore of Babylon and the coming of the kingdom and all these things, we have to keep in mind that this is a lot more like modern art than realism. And we have some explanation from the artist. We have the Gospels, and we have the Old Testament. And the book of Revelation, especially this middle section, is saturated in Old Testament. It is saturated in Old Testament. But we want to make sure that we are keeping a good understanding of what we're reading as we prepare to listen to it. Uh, and again, as we go through this middle section of Revelation, we want the text to be able to speak for itself. There are so many interpretations about this section of the book of Revelation. But what we want to do is we want to also give you guys the tools to kind of know what's going on. Uh, so as you listen, you know what you're listening for. And so for this first few minutes, this first 10, 15 minutes before we read, we have three goals. The first is that we want to rethink how we approach the text. Because if you're like me, for 32 years, I have just kind of blindly accepted that I don't really understand this. Most of my information has been secondhand. I, I don't know how I'm supposed to approach this book. And so we want to go over a couple things. One, we need to remember this text is not a secret code, not primarily. What is main is plain. We want to remember that the text is not a tragedy. Again, that bully you don't want to make eye contact with in the hallway. We need to fix our posture towards this text. Because as Christ said, when we see these things approaching, our redemption is drawing near. So we don't shy away from it. We walk into this. And lastly, the text is not a mystery. We know how it ends. We know that it ends with Christ coming and making all things new. The text is an unveiling of Christ's judgment on wickedness, which should grow us in faithfulness, endurance, and hope. That is what we should be receiving out of this book. The second thing we want to do is review key events, players, and symbols from each passage as we go through it. And lastly, we want to reflect on key truths that have real implications for us now. So before we dive into this next section of Revelation, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the book of Revelation. Uh, 
Often I, I think that we are the limiting factor, so I pray that you would illuminate our minds and our hearts, uh, open our ears to hear what you have to say, uh, that our lives might be changed, that we might grow in our endurance, our hope, and our faith through the power of your word. We love you and we thank you. Amen. So remember last week in 6 through 10 in the book of Revelation, we had the seven seals popping up. And every time a seal was opened, John saw something new, right? And so we saw these seven seals. We saw the victorious people of God from every tribe, nation, and tongue, along with the 144,000. We saw the other seals be opened, and we saw trumpets of God's judgment coming down on the people. And you kind of have these two rough forces of tribulation coming up from the people of the world and the judgment of God coming down, and the people of God kind of stuck in the middle of it. And what we saw through that, some of the reflections we looked at, was that I could stand faithful in the face of tribulation because Christ sits in a place of victorious completion. He's finished it. And so I can stand strong whatever, come what may. Secondly, I can wait patiently for God's justice because his mercy is never without opportunity. Again, he could have decided to fix everything immediately, but we would look less like Jesus and far less of us would know Jesus if he rushed the whole process. So, where we left off in 10 was that John ate the little scroll, which other prophets before him, Jeremiah, did something similar, as did Ezekiel, accepting his role as someone who is going to be a faithful witness in proclaiming the word of God to the nations. Where we start off in 11. Chapter 11 begins with the measuring of the temple. And this sounds weird unless you read the book of Zechariah. Because what he's told is an angel gives John a scroll, I mean a reed, and says, hey, go measure the temple. And what's going to happen is, is that as you measure the temple, the outer courts are going to get destroyed. And, and so what is he talking about this? with? Well, in the book of Zechariah, Zechariah is told by God to take a reed and measure the temple and measure the land. And he's told that this is a sign that when you measure it out, around this, the people of God and the place of God, my temple, Zechariah 2, 5, God says, I will be a hedge of protection around them and their glory within. Their protection without and their glory within. So we want to have that in mind in the book as we look at Revelation. There is this protection of God's people. And some people view this as literal, that when this happens, the temple itself will be protected while the outer courts, Jerusalem, the people of Israel will go through intense persecution because it says that the Gentiles will trample on the outer courts. But if we look at this with a New Testament lens as well, we look at our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit, taken in a New Testament lens more figurative, is that the persecution we receive without cannot take away from the victory within as God protects his people. So, we move from here to the two witnesses. So in the midst of what's going on, we have two faithful witnesses rise up. And again, some people view these to be individuals. But otherwise, he does call them his lampstands. And if you think back to Revelation 1.12 and 1.20 and to Luke 11, when lampstands are talked about, in other contexts it's talking about churches, right? The seven churches, these are the seven lampstands. And then in Luke 11, you are a light, a lampstand. Hide it under a bushel? No. Like, that, that's the context. And so these witnesses might be two people, but it, it might be two churches. And, but regardless of whether it is individuals or whether it is churches, what we have is faithful witnesses standing up to pick up the mantle of Elijah and Moses. And you'll see as we read the text, they have the power to bring plagues on the earth. They have the power to make the rain stop. And those are obvious references back to Moses and Elijah who were called by God to faithfully witness to a hard-hearted people in a hostile culture. And that's what you get here with these two witnesses. You get two witnesses, whether they be churches or individuals, who stand up to be faithful witnesses in the voice of God to a hard-hearted people in a hostile culture. What happens with these witnesses is these witnesses continue to be protected by God. They continue to faithfully proclaim the word of God as long as God continues to protect them. And then the text says that the beast, who we'll talk about in a little bit, is allowed to conquer them and they are killed. And you see a state of just how bad the world gets because 
these witnesses are killed and the world celebrates. They don't even bury them. They have a party around their dead bodies. They start exchanging gifts. And yet in the midst of all this evil frivolity, God breathes life back into these witnesses and he calls them home. You see this resurrection of the two witnesses and then this big earthquake takes place and a lot of people are killed. But the ones who aren't killed, they repent and they give glory to God because God's mercy is never without opportunity, right? We see this little glimmer of hope of those who are saved. Now, after this, we see the seventh trumpet. Remember, we were going through the trumpets and we get the seventh trumpet is the coming of the kingdom. And the kingdom comes, and similar to what we saw in the sixth seal, we see the kingdom of God coming down, 144,000, and we get, I love this verse, uh, this passage says that the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of our Lord. And when the coming kingdom comes down, any of you guys who know Handel's Messiah, and he shall reign forever, it drops straight into there, right? Now, scene break. So that's chapter 11. What we get in chapter 12 is reset. Because remember, the book of Revelation is not chronological, but it is a sequence of visions that John is seeing. And so we cut scene, and we go to this cosmic battle in chapter 12. We step away from the end times, and we step back so far away that we are looking at the plan of God on a cosmic scale for all time and eternity. And it starts with this woman coming down. He sees the symbol of a woman, John does. And she, sun and moon at her feet and 12 stars in her crown. And if we remember back to Joseph's dream in Genesis, the 12 stars, him and his brothers, being the beginning of the 12 tribes of Israel, are resting on her head. And this is Israel. This is the new Eve. This is the people of God who will give birth to Christ. And we know that because the text says... This is the woman who will give birth to a son who will reign all nations with an iron rod. But it's not the only symbol that's seen. So we see this woman coming down, but then we also see a dragon. And the dragon, the description starts really mystical. You know, we get these, all these heads and all of these uh, horns. But thankfully the text just tells us this is Satan. And Satan's desire is to devour the woman and to devour Christ. And so again, we're looking at like a 100,000 foot level, looking down on before anything else goes down, you have Satan's desire to overthrow Christ. And yet the passage says that the woman does give birth. God protects the child. He's ushered back to heaven. And the woman escapes into the wilderness, which aligns well with Mary going off to Egypt and then the people of Israel in the wilderness, right? Now Satan wages war in heaven against the angels of Michael. And as they war, the language is literally that Satan gets bounced out of heaven. And when he gets bounced down, he is a sore loser. And because he's a sore loser, it says he wages war on the rest of the children. His desire is to devour the rest of the people of God because he couldn't get Christ. And because of that, he is full of wrath and he is angry. And that is what we see in chapter 12, his anger towards the people of God. All right, chapter 13. If we weren't already in the weeds, we are officially in the weeds. (laughs) We get the beasts. So Satan is cast down. He's furious. He's waging war against the rest of the children of the woman, which are the people of God who hold to the testimony of Jesus. And then as he stands on the shore, we see that The dragon is waiting, and a beast rises out. And he gives global power and authority to this beast. He gives his voice to this beast. It'll have military dominance. It will have authority over all the nations, and people are going to worship this first beast. Thankfully, as we look at interpreting this, we aren't alone. Because remember how modern art, we need an interpretation from the artist? Well, we get one in the book of Daniel. Write on your notes after you spend time with your mother today or you talk to her. Write down to read Daniel 7 through 12 because none of this language is new. Don't go looking at the beasts without reading through Daniel 7 through 12 first. I was talking to uh, 
Derek Owen earlier this week, we were talking about the Old and the New Testament. He made a great point that you know that the Old and New Testament is sort of like some of these restored cars. Even if you've never seen one of the newer ones, if you are very familiar with the older ones, you kind of get an idea of what they're going to do with the new ones, right? And prophecy is the same way. So if we go back to Daniel 7 through 12, we see that there are these other beasts, but these beasts always represent nations who have horns that are kings and leaders. And we'll see that, yes, great beasts are coming, but beasts have already come. Babylon was a beast. Persia was a beast. Greece was a beast. Rome was a beast. And Daniel even calls the breaking up of the Roman nation into the four generals. Like, it's specific. And so we see that this first beast, most likely, if we interpret it against the rest of Scripture, is going to be a nation that rises up that will have power, and that will be driven by the worship of self and Satan. Then we see a second beast. Because the first beast will rise up and is dominant. If this is a nation, it is crushing on the people of God. And you get this sobering passage uh, as it is given permission to conquer the people of God. Because remember, sometimes as believers, we are called to conquer by being conquered physically. And we get this sobering passage at the end of chapter 13 that says to the one, uh, if anyone is to go into captivity, to captivity goes. If anyone is to be slain by the sword, he'll be slain by the sword. And you get this Hebrews 11 vibe of, yeah, you might be the one to shut the mouths of the lion. You might be the one that gets sawn in two. You might raise other people from the dead. You might be stoned to death. But the call to faithfulness is the same. And The fact that God is in control of it all is the same. The second beast is going to be more like the first beast PR guy. Now, if you look at the description, it has the voice of the dragon, Satan himself, but looks like the lamb. And so you'll get that it will deceive most of the people, all but the elect of God, all but those who are sealed in Jesus. It will deceive And so you get a rod of iron from the first beast who's conquering and powerful, and yet you get a deceiver and something that might look more attractive through the second beast. And one of the things the second beast is going to do is that the second beast is going to enact the mark of the beast. This gets a lot of ink spilled on it and gets covered in a lot of fiction. If any of you guys are concerned that your credit card, your Apple ID, or your vaccination might accidentally turn into the mark of the beast, and your salvation is void, don't. (laughs) That's not really a thing. Because see, what this is, when we see the mark of the beast, yes, the little beast will encourage the worship of the first beast. So you're seeing nations most likely oppressing the people of God formally to a point where this will be something tangible because people won't be able to buy or sell or get food unless they accept the mark of the beast. But what the mark of the beast really is, the mark of the beast is a sign of worship, love, and volitional allegiance. Where do I get that? Well, the mark of the beast is the anti-Shema. Because what are we doing? We're writing it on our foreheads and on our wrists, and it is a call to worship. Well, if you go back to Deuteronomy 6, this is obviously in contrast to that. Because the people of Israel, that was the point of decision. And every time after Deuteronomy 6, children would learn the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Hekron. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is who you're going to serve. This is your God. This is why you exist, to worship him. And the mark of the beast says, no, I am. Write this on your forehead. Write this on your wrist. Worship me. And so this is a contrast of allegiances between the mark of the beast and the mark of the spirit and the call to worship and obey him. And then lastly, in chapter 14, we get the 144,000 and the lamb again. The blameless ones coming. And the lamb comes, and we get another image of victorious Christ, Mount Zion, coming down. And chapter 14 ends with three messages and two harvests. The first one, and I love the way the passage says it, it is the eternal gospel. You get an angel swooping down. He says, fear God, give him glory, and worship him. And isn't it awesome that that eternal gospel hasn't changed? 
and it won't change. So like in the midst of all of these crazy descriptions and all of these world events that are going on, as believers, we are called to something very simple. Not easy, but simple. The gospel hasn't gone and changed on us. Fear God, give him glory, and worship him. And then the second messenger comes, and this is more of a headline than a command. Lady, Lady Babylon has fallen. In Isaiah 66, uh, Lady Babylon, it became this symbol among the people of God for uh, the seductive and sexually immoral draw of culture. You see Babylon itself, but even then Peter later on, Peter will refer to say those who are in Babylon greet you. And he was nowhere near Babylon, but he was using Rome and using Babylon as a descriptor of Rome doing this same thing. But the allure and seduction of secular society in a secular world. And the second angel swoops down and says, she has fallen. She is no more. And then a last angel comes and gives a warning message. If you, if you worship the beast, you're going to receive God's wrath. If you worship the beast, you're going to receive God's wrath. So you get a, a command to follow within the gospel, and you get a headline of, look, if you're siding with her, it's the wrong spot to be. And same thing with the beast. You will receive God's wrath. So, lastly, we get two harvests. And these follow up on the three messages. The first one is the harvest of the righteous. Angel comes down. And this is the harvest that Jesus talks about. Like, look, the harvest is ripe. And this is the harvest of the faithful, those who will receive Christ. And they're being harvested for the new kingdom and to be part of the new heavens and the new earth and to give glory to God at all times. The second harvest is a great harvest, and this is wrath. It's, we get the picture of a harvesting of grapes to be sent to the press to be crushed. And it gets very graphic where he talks about the blood will be so high it'll be up to a horse's waist, which is given some shocking imagery to what is going on with the wrath of God here. So if you look at chapters 11 through 14, as we read them, sort of the flow we get is we get the faithful witnesses of God, their, God's protection of them, a cosmic battle going on in heaven, the two beasts, and then the lamb. So a couple of reflections I want to touch on as we prepare to read this. The first reflection is this. Our road to victory is certain, but it is steep. Because man, it's awesome to look at those witnesses, and see like, you know what? I know that God is going to be victorious, and he protected them. And then he lets the beast kill him. And then when the beast rises up, the one who will be slain will be slain. The one who goes to captivity will be captive. And we get constantly in Revelation this back and forth of the glory of the Lamb and how much control God has and the wrath that's going to come against those who are in the beast and those who choose to give their allegiance to something other than Jesus. But then you do always see the people of God kind of beaten up on. And so our road to victory is certain, but it is steep. And this has a couple implications for us as believers. The first one is this. We got to be careful about taking a Mario Kart mentality into a Mad Max world. And what I mean by that is that if you are like, and I'm glad if anyone is watching online, but if your view of church and Christianity is tuning in online once a month or popping your head in the door every two weeks or your Bible intake in your prayer life is boiled down to before dinner and whatever you catch from what other people post on Facebook, you are bringing a Mario Kart faith against a Mad Max world. And so as believers... Yes, take confidence in the fact that our victory is sure. But the road is steep. And are you conditioning? Do you have a faith that can take a punch? Because what we're called to, and we see it all through the New Testament. We saw it in the Old Testament. But we really see it in Revelation. Is twice, just in the chapter 13, we get this is a call of endurance for the saints. This is a call of endurance for the saints. Because there will be things you have to endure through. Maybe you're on the other side, though, and you're like, you know, sometimes it doesn't even feel like our victory is that sure. But if you're on the downtrodden side, on the one side, I feel like we can have a tendency to be a little bit lazy. And because our current context 
and our current world doesn't force us to be conditioning well spiritually, to be praying for ourselves, to be getting into the word for ourselves, to be building relationships with other believers that will last and can encourage and sharpen one another. We just don't do it. We can get lazy about it. But on the other side, if you feel burdened, if you feel overcome, hold on to the fact that, yes, our victory is sure. It might be steep, but it's sure. My favorite professor used to say, uh, the warnings of the Bible are there to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. So maybe you're too comfortable and you need the reality of how steep this road is to push you a little bit. Or maybe you need to rest in the, flat, in the fact, take comfort in the fact that yes, we've been promised affliction, but Christ will be there on the other side and he'll work us through it, not always pluck us out of it. Secondly, our enemy is defeated, ultimately, but dangerous in the meantime. What was crazy as I look at the cosmic battle of Revelation 12 is that you see the angels talking about Satan, the dragon that was thrown down, but just how vengeful and angry he is that he is lost. And even just in that passage, they call him the great deceiver, the schemer, the accuser. The one who will push the saints all the way to death. The, talks about the believers being faithful even unto death. And it was Satan who pushed them there. And so again there are two pitfalls when we look at this reflection. The one is some of us need to get a good grip on the fact that the enemy is defeated. You don't have to fear him like you fear someone who's going to win. But on the other side he is still dangerous. Still to be taken seriously. He is still deceiving, he is still accusing, and he is still persecuting. In World War II, D-Day kind of marked a shift in momentum, right? Uh, once D-Day was successful, for practical purposes, the war was basically over. And yet it took another year before anything official was signed. So in the grand scheme of things, it was over. But people were still dying. People were still being shipped to different places around the world. Moms were still losing, losing kids. And that's the reality of the world we live in right now. Satan is defeated. D-Day has happened. And when Christ died on the cross, that was the mortal wound. But he's ticked about it. And he is still waging war against the saints. And we need to take that seriously. And lastly, and I'm going to go ahead and ask the readers to come up and prepare to read. Uh, something that stuck out to me is that the choice is clear and immediate. Because one of the things that I think it can be easy to do is hide behind all the symbolism of Revelation. Right? Because if I'm waiting for some beast to come out of the sky and make things really intense and force me, my allegiance, either to or away from God, well, I might be waiting a very long time. But what sticks out to me is just how clear it is. Right now, we have the choice. Right now, you are living in allegiance to Christ or not. Right now, you have either accepted Christ as your hope or you haven't. Right now, that eternal gospel to honor him, give him glory, and worship him stands just like it did right when he died and just like it will at the end. And it's easy to put off our response to the gospel to when all this happens. But the call to worship Christ is now. The call to choose whether to be selfish unto yourself and worship yourself and worship this world or worship Jesus is now. And it's clear. It's not quite as confusing as we sometimes want to make it. We can hide behind confusion. And so I encourage you guys, as we read this text, let's be honest and allow the Spirit to speak to us in it. Let's stay condi conditioned for the steep road, confident in the sure victory, and confident in the fact that we have chosen our allegiance is before Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you that uh, though you don't always pluck us out of every difficulty, that you are always there with us in it. Pray that you continue to sharpen us, grow us, grow us in our faith, in our endurance, and in our hope in you. Because above all, this is an unveiling of who you are, which is beautiful. 
pray that we would see that and you'd make that real in our hearts and in our lives. We love you and we thank you. Amen. Revelation chapters 11 through 14. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar. Count the worshipers there, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These men have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them And will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after three and a half days of breath of life from God entered them. And they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from the heavens saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in this earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe had passed. The third woe is coming soon. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ And he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of, the, of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for for 1,260 days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. This ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who 
leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now has come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time, out of the servant's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commands and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like a those of a bear and the mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and his great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast all whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, to the sword he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, he had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even calling down fire from heaven to the earth in full view of men. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the, of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it, for it is man's number. His number is 666. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roaring of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. 
And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and the lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is the Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud. Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. 